do because they um, take longer to start and can all prove. No one's in a different living states, but they're brought up as the time goes on. So if they were on three hours, they'd be told to come up for one hour, so they'd all come in to get ready. Uh, and didn't take them, of course, for one hour, because in time they'd have a few parts of the day. They must have that back in their life. Um, and then, of course, they would get screaming if there's uh, any chance of a few hours being launched. And all of them would be there to meet them. So they'll get launched. Uh, and we'll get them all to meet up, go together, and they'll top us up for a maximum of 12 hours. Having said that, if something pops up unexpected, we will just launch that tank and go and have a look. So, they've got the one who's there more. Make single seat fighter developed by Britain. In August 1954, Robbie Beaumont began test flying the experimental prototype designated the P1. On flight three, um, we, had been, we had very successful handling experience on flights one and two, and we'd come into one or two minor problems that needed looking at, but nothing to stop us going ahead. Um, and on flight three, it was decided to take the, uh, the then cleared flutter speed of 450 knots up to the top of pause um, and see how it behaved up there. Um, on the previous flight, we'd, uh, we'd been to 0.98 mark number at 30,000 feet, and the aeroplane had seemed to stop there as if it had come up against a, um, a fairly formidable drag rise. But on this particular flight, um, we accelerated at about 32,000 feet to um, 0.97, um, and then held full throttle in level flight, and it was a clear day going down the serpent um, towards... Um, uh, um, Selsey Bill, um, and uh, I remember wondering whether we were going to be stuck against this track rise because it, the Mark meter was only showing 98 for, for what seemed to be quite a long time, and all of a sudden while I was thinking about this it gave a bit of a shake and swung up to 1.05 without a tremor, without any vibration, uh, no trim change, nothing at all, it just, just a movement on the mark meter. And uh, there we were, supersonic in level flight for the first time in a British airplane. Um, just to make sure that um, there was no doubt about this, um, I throttled back somewhere between Selsey and Brighton, turned left, a very clear day, I could see the whole of the south of England pretty well, um, throttled right back, we were getting fairly well down on fuel, um, uh, set up a heading back for Boscombe, called Boscombe to that um, I was returning, and then when uh, over Winchester, it was still about 30,000 feet, I thought, well, well, we'll prove once and for all whether this might be as accurate or not, and um, I pointed the, the P1 down to the, cent uh, the centre of Boscombe Down, which was, you can see it miles away with its long white runway. Um, he used to throttle forward at about 29,000 feet to slip through Mark 1 on the Mark meter. And by the time I got down there, nobody was in the any data at all that the P1 had gone supersonic. In 1957, we had the P1 being fired in the variant with two Rolls Royce RA24 engines with Rikis um, and the revised cockpit uh, necessary for a fighter. Um, the the pilot sitting position had been raised, and the windscreen raised, and the canopy raised above the rear fuselage line uh, to provide a degree of, of rear vision to the left of right. It wasn't perfect um, fighter vision. Um, as the test pilot responsible, I tried to get the designers to produce a one-piece canopy uh, with 360 degree, or with 180 degree rear vision all round. Um, uh, but they said that in, in the interest of safety, with, the, with an airplane which was potentially going to get out to Mark II, twice the speed of sound, um, that, that they would need a, a mixed construction canopy because they said um, an all one plexiglass canopy would possibly suffer uh, thermal distortion at the temperatures associated with twice the speed of sound when we got there. Well. This was possibly over caution, but anyway, uh, we did have a slightly improved vision for the fighter pilot in the P-1B, the Lightning. Did the first flight of the P-1B in May 1957, and this was a very, very remarkable experience because it was essentially a P-1 with all the good, excellent qualities of uh, control of the hydraulic uh, power control system of the P-1, uh, but with 
uh, very substantially more power. We had two RA, uh, RA-24 engines with reheat, um, each of which gave 15,000 pounds thrust uh, at sea level. Um, at first flight, uh, the PYB prototype XA-847 um, weighed 28,500 pounds. So we had a, a better than one-to-one -one thrust weight ratio on that airplane, uh, and it, it was the first um, uh, airplane of its category in the world that w what was, in, in fact, um, able to stand on its own reheat thrust. <laughs> defense pilots uh, most of the things are taught very well throughout training which is a year and a half here on the lightning and it's retained in in the person's um, head basically all the procedures and what, you, what have you so he does not have to just um, plan maps etc so therefore we can start a bit later than the normal uh, flying squadron and that would be for something like a quarter to eight met proof so if I come in go to met proof a quarter to eight uh, usually get back to the squadron about five to eight quick cup of coffee, change it to flying uh, kit. Obviously the, the thing you actually do first of all is when you actually walk out to an aircraft is you will walk around, um, you normally we methodically have a sort of left to right system where you start um, by the ladder. Most people would just deposit their helmet there and have a look at the missile, the covers on the missile. You go around, you check, uh, there's nothing in the intake, nothing was left there. Uh, the radar bullet itself was uh, in order. The pitot probe at the front, you want to check that it's not blocked and the stand on one above. Uh, you go around, just check that the nose wheel the covers are loose enough and not stiff so the, the nose wheel will go in. Uh, and generally, go around the aircraft, just checking that there's no drips from unusual places. The lightning always drips a lot anyway. But you'd be looking that there would be no hydraulic fluid, for instance, coming out, uh, either down the earliers or around the actual system. And the guy's just looking for panels, make sure there's nothing loose, nothing hanging off, all the pressures are right on the certain skin gauges that are around there, that the, um, the wheels are in good order, it's, there's not a big uh, crack developed where you could get a tyre burst. Uh, with the sort of real high tyre pressure we have, we see we're quite interested in our uh, condition of them. And you just generally go around checking everything's good, that all the, um, the locks and uh, flags are away. So you do all that, and when you are happy with it, you then uh, would climb up the ladder, and before getting in, check the ejector seat. And that is your last hope when you're flying. So guys are pretty particular about that.
So you check the seat completely, and then you making sure also that the pins are safe. So you'd sit down, and you'd want to get some of the system started before you strap in. Because by the time you strapped in, you'll have a few things running for you. And normally some, a lot of items take about two minutes to warm up. So you would check, first of all, that the undercarriage lever was down and um, was not in the up and retractable position. You don't know, it's, you've just walked out to an aircraft, anybody could have gone up there and done, messed around with the cockpit before you put power on. Once you've got uh, the power on and you check the power works and your own aircraft internal power works, i.e. the battery, um, you would then start switching a few things on, like the radar, um, your main instrument panels, radio, um, and other associated equipment that takes time to warm up. Once that's going, you then strap in. You have a grand crew member just to help you. Uh, normally, a guy can strap in fairly fast and comfortably within a minute. Once you're strapped in, of course, you take your pins out and stow them, and then it's a case of just going left to right around the cockpit. We all have procedures, you learn procedures, and once you've actually been doing it for a while, anybody who's got anything over 50 hours on the aircraft, it's quite natural to do. You go around switching things on, checking um, things like oxygen, fuel, uh, you name it, you check it. There's not a dial there that uh, isn't looked at. The main interesting thing about it is probably something to do with human nature, is as you're actually sitting in a cockpit, your eye just immediately picks up a switch or a toggle or something which is amiss or wrong, even without being part of your check, you haven't actually started left to right, for instance, going, that's just left side of the cockpit, your eye will pick it up. And it's just one of those things, you can jump in and uh, immediately go to it. But that's not the thing you do, you, you check everything. And when you're ready to start, um, you just give the signal to the ground crew. And again, there's a few checks just to make sure everything's working in order before you start the aircraft. Uh, and it's a matter of starting one engine, checking out the systems from that engine, the first engine is duplicated, and then start the second engine and again test the systems out. Once you've got both engines running, the canopy's down, and two sets of checks, i.e. the crew takeoff and the free landing checks, they're the only ones that people do make sure they know word perfect without actually uh, going in the wrong order. They do know word perfect and they do it word perfect. So that means we'll take off with two engines in good order and uh, with the right fixed airplane down and you're not going to lose something like a canopy, and you're certainly not going to have to eject um, and worry or die because you have got to take a pin out. And most pilots, in fact, I say all pilots, because you know, sitting with people when they do their checks, the sort of things they do just before they take off is always check the caravan. That's the control is uh, on the side just to make sure that he doesn't spot anything. That they've uh, got full control movement because the last thing you want to do is get airborne and put them back on the stick and find that when it rolls you can't correct it and then you just roll into the ground. So the controls, they'll check the captions or all out so you've also got no problems. Um, like the canopy is locked and that is important because at about 140 miles an hour, that's about the time when it will lift off. Um, just as you're raising the next wheel, that is when it would go. So you check there. So the captions, canopy, pins, those are the last, the last things. But pilots generally throughout just they survive on drills and checks. And the nice thing about it is the more you do it, the more it becomes second nature. subsonic intercept practice over the North Sea. We will conduct this with two airplanes, two lightnings. We'll take off from Boombrook, transit out through the normal air traffic radar uh, until we talk to Vollmer or Staxton Wald, which are two military radar sites on the East Coast. They will then control us and split the pair up. One airplane then will run as target and the other one runs as fighter and we operate right through a profile, detecting the target, shooting it down or identing it as the case may be, and then we swap over and the first chap becomes fighter and the other guy becomes target. And we will run that through, say, half a dozen intercepts until the fuel is getting low. And the fuel in the lightning has always been a problem, uh, but on a subsonic sortie, we can expect about an hour's duration. On a low-level sortie, this could be about 45 minutes. 
and on one of the more exotic sorties like combat or low level affiliation then it can actually be as low as 30 minutes. This does mean that the pilot's fuel awareness has to be exceptional. Um, it's a very unforgiving aeroplane if you do run short of fuel. It's a big powerful aeroplane, it's a very thirsty aeroplane and the fuel does go down very quickly. Uh, I would think most lightning pilots of my vintage can recall an occasion or two when it's been a bit less than it should have been. Um, coming back into Bimbrook, then we normally land with 800 pounds a side. That's a meaningless figure to uh, someone not in the know, but that gives us enough fuel to land comfortably. If we have a problem with the undercarriage or someone crashes on the runway immediately ahead of us, it gives us enough fuel to go to an emergency diversion, which is normally within about 20 miles. If the weather is poor or there are other considerations, then we may come back with a higher fuel reserve. Coming back into Bimbrook, our normal way to get back in is a visual approach. And if the weather is good enough, we quite simply find Grimsby and uh, continue in, find the airfield and break into the circuit. But Bimbrook's fairly notorious for its weather factor. Uh, quite often in the winter time, the weather is quite poor. And under those conditions, then we will have to use either the instrument landing system or uh, an air traffic control, ground control approach. Provided you keep your wits about you, provided you keep thinking ahead, and provided you work well with air traffic controllers, there are no problems but it is easy to be caught out and again it comes into the whole problem of flying the airplane with a high workload and the necessity for a, a very high situational awareness. It would be a Bravo and Oscar for myself and the boss, the T5s to be allocated by the engineers. Okay. So the call sign is Bravo for, uh, I'm sorry, Bravo's your head, perhaps, sir. I will take Oscar, that's the one with the Dickie M.O.G. So I thought you'd better have it 200 feet. I will be listening out as you go through the box with Adam Take it out more than several times. Is it possible to let us do as we did this morning, to stay at sort of about 350 knots until minus two, and then accelerate to data? when we uh, practice shooting down other airplanes and we take the intercept to the point where we press the trigger and a little light comes on in the cockpit which will tell us whether or not the missile will have gone. Clearly we have to be experienced in firing the missiles as well so the next step is to take the squadron to Valley in North Wales where we carry out the missile firing practice camp. as a 
target, a small radio control airplane known as a Jindavik, which tows behind it a uh, magnesium flare. And we are controlled very closely around the pattern by the radar unit at Aberforth. And they take us around various checkpoints on the profile. At each checkpoint, we have to ensure that various checks are done within the airplane, that the missile system has armed up, and so on. And by the time we're at about uh, two minutes to the firing, then we are picking up the target on our own radar. Once we're down to about a minute to go, we can generally see it visually. And then, very close to the actual firing point, the flare is lit by remote control from Aberport. Once the flare is lit, then we are clear to continue with the attack, and we can... Uh, the, the infrared seeker head on the missile will see the target, we receive an indication that the missile can see the target, and then we can fire. And uh, it's all over very quickly after that. The, the uh, missile leaves the aircraft and uh, holds straight on the target only. <laughs> Crashes. <laughs>